Afternoon, everyone. Um, John, thank you for the, uh, for the intro, but I think to describe RGA as, a, RGA as an advertising agency is a little bit like saying France is a country where they make berets. It's true as far as it goes, but it's, was that made in France? <laughs> but it kind of doesn't tell the whole story. Now, yeah. Uh, Bob started the company as a motion graphics production company. He's since taken RGA through more transformations than most companies go through in a couple of generations. It's also a world-class movie title shop, a digital studio, a major digital advertising agency, a brand and innovation consultancy, a startup accelerator, and today it's somehow all of these rolled into one. Um, it's imprecise English to call someone a legend while they're still alive. So let's not go there. Let's just say that Bob has won more <laughs> Lifetime Achievement Awards than most people have lifetimes. Um, hmm. And he's not done yet. Thank you. Uh, Nick Law joined RJ in 2011 when it was a little bean of a company with just 100 employees instead of 2,000 as today. And 2001, actually. You're off by a decade. Oh, well, okay. who's counting? That's why God made fact checkers. It's <laughs> Nick has become the driving creative force behind the company's extraordinary growth. Global chief creative officer, he's championed some of the company's most remarkable initiatives like the prototype studio and the startup um, accelerator. So we'll hear more about these from Nick. Bob, let's start with you. Okay. Um, in the course of your journey, you and RGA have shown up kind of Zelig-like in a number of improbable industries. Zelig, of course, being a movie made possible by your special effects. Yeah. Um, how is it, as an entrepreneur, that you've been able to see all these opportunities when others haven't? Um, I think I'm somewhat lucky in a way um, that I have a severe case of dyslexia, and it <laughs> things show up to me as patterns, and I've noticed that there are other uh, founders, CEOs, innovators that have the same problem, particularly as it relates to design and innovation. And when I see the patterns, I sometimes now understand that people just don't see things exactly the same way. And if they make sense as we start to talk them through, then my main goal as a CEO today is really to implement innovation. Can you take us through that pattern recognition process? Give us an example of how you saw some innovation and made the move? Well, right now, I think the biggest theme that's changing in our industry is that the um, consultancies are moving into marketing services. Um, I think the consultancy business is running out of uh, fume, so to speak, as is the traditional agency business. And they see it as an opportunity to move into something new and different. I could see that happening quite a bit of time before uh, the industry recognized it and we implemented a consultancy practice um, with the differentiator being that we implement what we consult on. We're trying to really help C-level clients innovate and Consultancies generally leave things at PowerPoint, and we're taking our agency, which has many departments and capabilities, and our startup accelerator, and we're helping clients implement the ideas that we present. Okay, good. Nick, um, not every agency has RGA's appetite for and willingness to embrace change. Um, what about the industry right now, as, it's, as it stands right now, strikes you as this kind of people clinging to old ways that are detrimental to, the, to their own business yeah. and to their client? Well, I mean, from a creative point of view, to me the biggest legacy that has is, that is stuck around for 50 years is how they organize a creative team. So in the, in the late 50s, a guy called Bill Burnback uh, bought the art directors from downstairs where they used to color in and brought them up and, and paired them with who were the people that were the, the idea makers, which is uh -huh. copywriters. And so they, so they created this team 
out of art and copy in the late 50s, the result of which was some really awesome print advertising, like the old VW work, the lemon yes, work. Yes, right, yeah. think small. Yeah, and, uh, and that was the last time that the creative team was innovated in, the, uh, in Madison Avenue, right? And that and was 50, 60 years ago? Yeah, exactly. And at a time when there were a handful of brands, a handful of media channels, and a very different sort of cultural relationship to advertising. And so one of the things that we've, we did actually about a decade ago is that we have a different organizing principle around stories and systems. Uh, uh, and we recognize both endeavors as creative. One is more of a design uh, um, discipline, and the other one is a storytelling discipline. And how they work together is really uh, this sort of tension between simplicity and possibility uh, that, that you have in the world now. And to me, it's astonishing that we're the only agency that has rethought that creative team. Because the other agencies, I think, typically keep the art director and copywriter as, a, as the atomic team, and then they build services around them, even though that atomic team is probably uh, not capable of doing a lot of the things that need to be done now. Can you give me some examples of, of what kind of magic happens when you bring the simplicity and the possibility together? Well, the, the, for us, the most stark difference is that we invert this process where the, we, we think about a behavior before we think about a, a message, right? So if you think of an idea that is just a message, just a tagline, that sort of belongs in the burn back era. But now most media that we use has an interface in front of it, and it has an interface so you can interact with it. You can do all sorts of things at the point of contact with the brand. You can transact, you can share it with a friend, you can do all these things. So from a creative point of view, you need to think about that. Like what is the audience, how's the audience going to behave? And then you figure out what the, you distill that into a message. So we sort of flip, we invert that process. We think first about the behavior and then we put the message in after it. And the old way was to spark an emotion first and yeah. hope that the action follows. Well, if you think about it, media for the longest time could, was this top-down, uh, you know, you could just broadcast, and, and you can make people feel something about your brand, but it wasn't connected to any, any behavior other than receiving, and in, in most cases it was interrupting you, so it was a very top-down process, and it, that just doesn't work anymore. I can, a tagline that just makes me feel something doesn't really help my relationship with the brand. Right, and it certainly doesn't cause a transaction yeah. or anything else. Um, of the thousands of, of movies, of, of commercials, of untold other pieces of work RGA has done, and I put this question to both of you, but Bob first, is there one that you're proudest of? That I uh, think is... Uh, Your best work. Our best work. Um, of the movies, I, uh, I really like uh, Braveheart as a, as a movie because it predicted a lot of the um, direction in which special effects would go. Ultimately, uh, Game of Thrones is somewhat similar. Uh, we killed an awful lot of horses, and, <laughs> but we did it digitally. Uh, and also, the crowd scenes were we're not that large, but we made them very large um, through digital um, cloning, as it's called. Uh -huh. I, think, um, I think in terms of commercials um, and, and other things, we, we look at fuel band as being really important for us because it led us into our uh, startup accelerator. It led us into creating a... Uh, very advanced uh, website in which the data that comes out of it is extremely relevant to Nike's new direction with membership. I think it also was the very first or best example of the Internet of Things and connected devices. Okay, good, thanks. So, uh, Nick, same question to you. In 16 years, what's your best work? Oh, it's the next piece, obviously. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, we're, we're, at, we're in the third generation or the third iteration of a campaign we've been doing for the Ad Council called Love Has No Labels. Uh. Uh, and, you know, it's a pure narrative piece that, that lives um, in social primarily. 
and that's been hugely successful and reached a lot of people. So we're proud of that, uh, particularly since it's for a good cause. Yes. Um, and you know, the, the, the ongoing work that we do for Nike now, it may not be as, as, um, uh, uh, as visible all the time, mm -hmm. but the sort of, um, you know, working on the initiative that Bob's talking about, which is making sure that Nike um, serves its members and we do that in all sorts of little ways, and we're always experimenting about how to do that and create more one-on-one -on -one relationships. So that's a sort of ongoing thing that's, that's very exciting. Um, you know, you can't do great work if you don't have a great team and you haven't got them engaged. And um, RGA has the great honor of having been named one of the best places to work in advertising. What have you done to make that happen? What do you, what's the secret? Well, it's not ping pong tables, is it? No. <laughs> no. It's uh, well, I mean, I think RJ is one of those places where people go to do their best work. And, you know, the culture is the work. And, and uh, so if they're doing good work, they're happy. The worst thing that can happen for creative people particularly is that they not create work. The, you know, so as long as they're busy and they're talented and we do get our fair share of talent, then the culture sort of looks after itself. Ah, that's good. Bob, what would you add? I think... Um that we spend an awful lot of time uh, figuring out physical space to try to get it to be as um, optimum for uh, integration and collaboration. Uh, when people feel they're part of a team, they do a lot better work. I think also we've managed to um, concentrate on making things and I think the tech companies uh, that are going after the same talent base um, often uh, are, are not uh, very good at implementing and making things. Making things, you mean having a product you can see through from the beginning to the end and yeah. take pride of yeah. ownership in. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit more about making a team atmosphere. Does it mean the proximity in which teams work? Does it mean segways and roller skates in the hallway? <laughs> I think that RGA noticed in the very beginning that the advertising model is actually one that's a competitive model. And RGA worked hard on developing the model that comes out of feature films and production, which is one of collaboration. So when we build our teams, we build them to be extremely collaborative throughout our network. We now have 17 offices, soon to be 18. And each one of our offices also works collaboratively between one another, and we transfer a lot of people. So the opportunity to work with distant teams on really cool projects and also with the potential of being tra transferred uh, well, really helps the teamwork. Did you have a mentor as you were coming up in the industry? A yeah. me or, or if not a mentor who actually worked with you, uh, someone you admired, someone you modeled yourself after? I think the person that I admired most currently is Steve Jobs. Um, I met him, I even did a small amount of work with him at one point. But what he was able to accomplish with uh, simplicity of design and putting together all the things that RGA is interested in, technically speaking and otherwise, I think he's a really cool um, person uh, that really did amazing things. I think um, I got to know Jay Shia, and Jay in 1993 created a uh, uh, virtual agency. And he was way ahead of his time, and I was proud to say that he had a big influence on me, as did Richard Sauerman, who founded the TED Convention. And my brother, Richard, sorry. Uh, Nick, same question for you. Is there um, someone you've modeled yourself after, someone you really looked up to in your career? I mean, early on I was in design and I worked with Alan Fletcher in Pentagram, so he was a big influence. Yes. Um, you know, and obviously uh, Bob is, is not just a great mentor, but he's a great example of what not to be. Nah, he's a good guy. 
Bob's going to do a dance like that last robot did pretty soon. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the, the thing about our industry, one of the things that holds it back, I think, is this sort of crushing sentimentality. Uh, and I think that it's, it's, it's a lot healthier for people in our industry to have examples and mentors outside of it. So, so it stops turning in on itself. Yes. Uh, and I think, I think that'd be the sort of advice I'd give to anyone in, in marketing, is look for mentors outside of the industry. Outside of the industry. Yeah. Great. Um, looking at, at what you know about the industry and, and what you feel as people who are stewards of your company and responsible for all the people who work for you, what worries you? What keeps you up at night? Uh, Bob, I'll put that question to you first. Uh, well, I don't sleep, so <laughs> <laughs> last night at five in the morning, I was just thinking. Um, I think the thing that keeps me up at night is what's happening to the industry. In the advertising business, uh, there's a lot of what we would have done in the past being brought in-house at uh, corporations. I think... Um, the business has become more one of uh, projects than of uh, retainers. I think um, the clients, particularly the leadership, is changing out very rapidly and they, they also are not that knowledgeable about innovation and they don't want to take very many uh, chances. Uh -huh. I think that uh, we see um, procurement leading things and you know, we never know, even if we're being recommended, if we're going to get work because at the end of the day, somebody might come in a lot less expensively. We uh, put so much money into pitches um, that it may take us often a year or even more to earn back uh, and start making uh, the relationship profitable. So my things are, generally speaking, and thinking about um, things other than the advertising business. Because as the advertising business deconstructs, RGA has to create things that are new and innovative. I think our uh, startup accelerator, which we call our venture studio, is really gotten a, lot, a very high profile. We'll have about 100 companies that we're invested in at the end of this year. And our consultancy business is the fastest growing part of our company, which we no longer call an agency because it's changing so rapidly. And we're really focused on IP and owning the intellectual property that, or part of it that we produce. Great. Nick, same question for you. Well, I mean, I, I, I feel the same way about the advertising industry as Bob. I think there's two things that we can offer clients. One is it's something completely different. So there are some things that, that advertising cannot solve and, and some things that even marketing as a sort of larger discipline can't solve where it needs to be uh, sort of closer to being a product or, or, a, sort of, uh, or a consultancy relationship. Uh -huh. uh, but even when we're doing classic marketing, classic narrative marketing, there's a different way to do the same thing, right? And, and for me, the, the best example of it is when we're doing something that's filmic, you know, like the, the Love Has No Labels film, yes. is that you think about that narrative first as something that lives in the stream. And so the criteria you bring to that is less about what the, about what the brand wants to say and more about what the audience wants to say and how the brand relates to that. It's a very different, it, again, it's this sort of inversion of an old process. If for the longest time we push these messages down into the world, and our concern was what do our clients want to say, I think you, you can't really get much traction in culture now unless you think about the audience in the same way that software designers think about the user. What are they going to do with this thing? Because you're not always uh, able just to buy attention. So you've got to earn it in, in this way. So I think that's a big craft shift. It's like coming up with a different grammar of advertising that, I, that you know, is something that we concentrate a lot on. Because in contrast, I think, um, the, uh, the, the more traditional advertising agencies have just got this muscle, these tropes of advertising which they just keep going back to, and I don't think they work anymore. In culture, they don't work. Forget about if they're reaching people or not, they just don't work. Yes. All right, good, thank you. Um, sure. All right, so it's 
RGA's story over its many years has been its ability to anticipate change. So let's put you on stage talking about that and make a prediction. In the next five years, what's going to happen in the industry that is going to surprise people in this room? Um, I think what's going to happen in the industry in the next five years is that um, I think the TV commercial, um, particularly the metaphorical TV commercial, is going to become more and more relevant. Uh, I don't see where it fits in the current media mix. However, I do see um, stories being told around demonstrations of products and services, which um, could be done very creatively and in a very interesting way, sometimes with the metaphor included, uh, sometimes on their own. I think that um, there's going to be a lot more emphasis on um, innovative products and services. So we're finding that we've always been involved in that space, but we're going to move much more into um, having clients uh, sponsor uh, new and innovative products and services. OK. Could you, uh, just for the sake of grounding it for the audience, Describe what you mean by a metaphorical commercial. Metaphor? Um, when I was at Cannes uh, a few years ago, all the commercials that won gold awards um, would have been metaphorical. I, I use a uh, example that um, Goodby did, which is a really wonderful award-winning uh, computer-generated film where there's a rabbit running and it then gets stretched out into a rabbit panther kind of thing. And then it gets shaved uh, by the sharpest blades and put on ice. It's going really, really fast and they load this uh, highly caffeinated loony driver on top of it and launch it off of a ski lift. And you're supposed to put that together with Comcast's faster broadband services. Well, I don't think that people have that much attention power to follow a story like that. Uh, you may see it as something cool, and you may pick up a bit of the brand, but those kinds of metaphors are no longer working. Most of the young millennials have unplugged anyway. Hardly anybody's watching network TV in the US and across the world. And it's the TV series that uh, doesn't have commercials. So products and services like the current advertising for both iPhone and Samsung are examples of demonstrations. OK, Nick, a, a short trip into the future. What's going to surprise people in the room in the next few years? Well, I think the thing that's going to characterize our industry is that it's, connect, it, it, it's going to be continued to be connected to everything else. So even talking about a discrete advertising industry, I think, put yourself in a sort of boutique situation. The reason that we have these three discrete business models of consulting, the agency, and the ventures is, is that they, are, they all connect. They're sort of symbiotic. And I think this is a characteristic of an age where things are literally connected, thanks to the internet. And so things affect everything else, and it's very difficult to do anything without thinking about the effect of everything else. Uh -huh. So, you know, that's, I made that point when, when you're doing something like an ad, like a, like a TV ad, you've got to think about it in all of these different contexts because it's connected to all these different screens, all these different behaviors, all these different, um, you know, people. So, so I think that the, the thing that's going to change most in the industry, that what we think of as this sort of narrow advertising industry is just going to be a part of a much, a much bigger enterprise that companies are going to be trying to do. So that's, you know, we, we've connected things very deliberately, not just because they represent uh, commercial opportunity, it's because we don't think you can do this unless you think about the effect of that and how it'll live there. So it, part of what your skill as a, as a sort of an agency or a marketing partner will be is how do you curate all of these opportunities and think about how they connect choreograph them systematically over time. So there's a big sort of design piece to this, 
that didn't exist 50 years ago. Okay, great, thank you. All right, yeah. uh, we have uh, a few minutes for questions. And uh, so if you just raise your hand, there are mic runners there and there. Who has a question? Or uh -oh. Bob or Nick? Who wants to see Bob dance? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, th there's a question over there. Uh-oh, a woman. Uh-oh, a man. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Waving uh, to a friend. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Hi, everybody. Uh, um, who do you think is going to win uh, the, the war between consultancy and uh, advertising in leading the uh, brand uh, communication? What? Who's going to win the war between uh, agencies and consultancies, right? Right. Yeah, so I mean, well. I think that there are a lot of things, especially in the more automated space, that the consultancies are well positioned uh, to do. I, I think that the hardest thing for consultancies to do will be to create a, a creative culture. And a creative culture is a culture that loves risk. Um, and I think that consultancies typically sell process and processes that mitigate risk. So I think that'll be the hardest thing to do. Is, would be, is, it's, not, it's not deciding what to do, it's how yeah. to create a culture of creativity. And in the end, I think there's always, for the best work that we do, there's an intuitive leap. There's all sorts of information and intelligence that we gather, but there's, at the end of it, there's always an intuitive leap that, uh, that is a risk. And I think that their tolerance for risk right now is pretty low, culturally. Yes. And, and also just diversity of minds. I think, you know, we've got a bunch of freaks at RGA that couldn't get conventional jobs elsewhere. We don't have a lot of MBAs, you know, and I just think that they're going to have to get comfortable with the idea of a culture that is, that is inclusive, not just in a, in a um, you know, gender or race, but, but as a sort of aptitude, it's like very different ways of thinking, slightly problematic people, you know, that, that are pain in the ass sometimes, but are incredibly talented. Yes, great. Who else? Rebels. Hi, I was uh, wondering how important influencers will be to the advertisement segment. Yeah. Can you tell me about that? I'm very, very excited about that. What is it? Uh, the importance of influencers. Influencers, oh. yeah, very important. I mean, very the, important. The, the trick obviously is to align influencers with whatever your brand stands for. So that's where, that, that's where you can have a misalignment. And you can't just use an influencer for reach if they, if they don't match what your brand's aspirations are. Yes. Uh, but we're building out all sorts of influencer networks. We think it's very important. I mean, the center of culture right now is in the stream. It's in social. So if you're not playing there in a serious way, uh, then you're not in culture. And a large part of that world is, is are these you know, influencers. I think. Um Nick said it, but I just want to make sure it's clear that the future of advertising, when we look further down the, the road just a little bit, is uh, social first. So influencers play a part in that. And then it sort of winds back to the earlier thing that Nick was talking about, um, consultancy versus agencies. I think they're going to come together in some odd way because first and foremost, RGA, we're not interested in doing anything that isn't creatively driven. So that isn't the first thing that comes to mind with consultancies. On the other side of it, we see the future of our business being consultative, helping C-level clients innovate, and then using all the things that we've developed over the years to help clients implement what we're uh, helping them with in a consultative way, maybe by also bringing in other partners. And influencers play a, a role in that, too. All right. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Bob Greenberg and Nick Law. Thank you. Thank you very thank you. much. <laughs>